Picture yourself in a sleek, powerful sports car racing down an open road with the wind in your hair and the roar of an engine in your ears. That's the feeling the Dodge Viper was meant to evoke, and it did so with unparalleled intensity. But let me warn you, what you're about to learn might shock you. Despite its sleek design and powerful V10 engine, the Viper had a darker side that few people knew about. It was a car that pushed the limits in every way possible, with a reputation for both being exhilarating and, at times, downright scary. In this video, we're going to explore the true story behind the Dodge Viper, a story that will make your heart race and your adrenaline pump. We'll take a deep dive into the car's development and evolution, from its early days as a concept car to its eventual discontinuation in 2017. But this isn't just a story about a car, it's a story about a passion, controversy, and the pursuit of the ultimate driving experience. As we journey through the highs and lows of the Viper's history, I'll reveal some shocking facts that will leave you breathless. So get ready to experience the drama, the excitement, and the thrill of the Dodge Viper. You won't want to miss a single moment of this heart-pumping journey through the ultimate American supercar. Let's start! The late 80s were a dark time for Chrysler, known for producing uninspiring cars that lacked any real flair. It seemed like the company was doomed to mediocrity. But all that changed when a group of fearless renegades led by legendary Bob Lutz decided to take a stand and create something truly extraordinary. Lutz, a former Ford executive, had a burning desire to make a fast car that would capture the world's imagination, despite Chrysler's reputation for making dull vehicles. He showed his personal replica of a Shelby Cobra 427 to Tom Gale, a lead designer at Chrysler who was immediately captivated by the idea of creating a new car that would be just as iconic. A team of daring engineers and designers were gathered. They included Francois Castaing, Dick Winkles, and Roy Sorberg, and they were given one goal to create a speed demon that would be both awe-inspiring and terrifying. And with Bob Lutz, a legendary automotive executive at the helm, they were unstoppable. Their journey was an epic tale of innovation, determination, and a dash of luck. They faced budget constraints, skeptical executives, and seemingly insurmountable obstacles. But they didn't let that stop them. They employed every trick in the book to bring their vision to life. The team was resourceful to say the least. They pieced together a prototype from a hodgepodge of parts, including a widened Corvette and even truck components. The first generation Viper was a patchwork masterpiece, but it had a soul that couldn't be replicated. With a classic long hood and short deck layout that harkened back to the iconic American muscle cars of the 1960s, the team named their creation the Viper and gave it a bold and aggressive logo. The first prototype was unveiled in the 1989 North American International Auto Show and it was an instant sensation despite being a little more of a sheet metal mock-up with truck parts and an old V8 engine. The Viper was a shock to the system for car enthusiasts who were used to seeing uninspiring vehicles on the showroom floor. This new American supercar not only looked better than the Corvette, but it also boasted a cooler name and was touted as the fastest car the US had ever produced. Enthusiasts clamored to get their hands on one, sending blank checks to Dodge, begging to be first in line. Bob Lutz and his team knew they had something special, with the world eagerly waiting for what was to come. The Viper team knew they needed a powerful engine to match the car's aggressive looks, so they decided to use a V10 engine instead of the aging V8. The decision to go with a V10 is shrouded in mystery, but one theory suggests that Americans were too cheap to go for a V12 engine like the Italians or a small displacement turbo engine like the Japanese. Early on, Roush Performance helped with the first V10 prototype engines, but for production, the team turned to Lamborghini, which was a subsidiary of Chrysler at the time. Lamborghini took the massive chunk of iron and corn dogs and transformed it into a refined piece of machinery made of aluminum. The result was a monster engine capable of delivering 8 liters of democratic power and 400 proud horses. The Viper team worked tirelessly, sacrificing weekends, holidays, and even sleep to meet the tight deadline for the 1992 Detroit Auto Show. And when the car finally debuted, it was a showstopper, generating massive buzz and excitement. The Viper was the antithesis of everything that had come before it. It was a rebellion against the bland, uninspired cars of the time, and it was here to shake things up. There was nothing comfortable or safe about this car. It was a monster on four wheels, a wild animal that could barely be tamed. 
There was no air conditioning to keep you cool on a hot summer day, no power door locks to keep you safe in a dangerous neighborhood, and no roof or windows to protect you from the elements. The only thing that could keep you safe was your own driving skills. The lack of amenities made it even more menacing, as it was clear that this car was built for one purpose, and one purpose only, to go as fast as possible. This car was not for the faint of heart or the weak-willed. No, it was a monster that demanded respect and fear. In short, the Viper was a monster of a car that was built to dominate the road, and it was here to show the world what American engineering was capable of. As the first-generation Viper struggled to establish its dominance on the racing circuit, engineers at Dodge were already hard at work on the next iteration of the legendary sports car. It was time to take things to the next level. The world was about to witness the birth of a true monster, a second-generation Viper. It was the development of the Viper GTSR race car. Imagine the moment when the second-generation Viper roared onto the scene, ready to take on the world with its powerful upgrades and technological advancements. This wasn't just any car. It was a monster, a machine designed to dominate every race and leave the competition in its dust. Under the hood, the engine had received a complete overhaul, with a bump in compression, reworked head gaskets, a revised camshaft, and upgraded exhaust manifolds that reduced internal friction and improved performance under the most grueling conditions. And let's not forget the dual-tip rear exhaust, which not only improved airflow, but gave the Viper an even more aggressive and menacing sound. Down a further 80 pounds over the first-gen design, it all added up to a rated 450 horsepower and 500 foot-pounds of torque. But this was just the beginning. The suspension had been completely reworked, the frame had been lightened and strengthened, and even luxuries like power windows and door handles had been added to make the Viper more comfortable to drive. And with the introduction of the hardtop Grand Touring version, the Viper was now a car that could compete with the best of them on both the track and the street. And compete, it did. With 16 out of 18 wins in various racing series, the Viper proved that it was a force to be reckoned with. And nowhere was the dominance more apparent than at the 24 Hours of Le Mans, where the Viper took the checkered flag and cemented its place in automotive history. It was a car that demanded attention, respect, and most of all, fear. As the third-generation Viper SRT rolled onto the scene, the team set their sights on the number 500, 500 horsepower, 500 foot-pound of torque, and 500 cubic inches. They wanted this car to pack a serious punch, and that's exactly what they delivered. With the revised, more efficient intake manifold, sodium-filled exhaust valves, and a return-to-side exhaust, the engine was heavily massaged and had an even broader power band. But their struggles were far from over. Changes in racing regulations meant that the Viper was no longer able to compete at the same level as it once could, and sales were starting to slump. The team knew they had to do something to turn things around. But what? They went back to the drawing board and got to work developing the fourth-generation Viper. This time, they wanted to create an all-new car with upgrades not only to the engine, but also the frame and suspension. But a new chassis and body would be too expensive to make the fourth-generation viable, so the project was scrapped. However, development was nearly wrapped up on the all-new 8.4-liter V10. They moved back to twin throttle bodies, but this time, they were fly-by-wire. The jump from 8.3 to 8.4 liters wasn't to increase power, but it was done out of necessity. It was too expensive to have the old pistons reproduced, so they just used off-the-shelf 6.1-liter Hemi pistons instead. They tried reworking the heads and adding a hemispherical design, but that made the engine too wide to fit between the frame rails. In 2008, the standout feature of the fourth-generation Viper was the addition of variable valve timing the first ever pushrod engine to sport this technology. The Viper was now capable of 600 horsepower and 560 foot-pounds of torque, making it even more venomous than ever before. Despite these impressive upgrades, the Viper faced an uncertain future. In 2010, it was temporarily discontinued. The main reason was the economic recession of the late 2000s, which led to declining sales for many sports car manufacturers. Additionally, stricter emissions and safety regulations were making it increasingly difficult and expensive to produce the Viper. Why was such an iconic car discontinued? The audience could feel the tension building as they waited for the answer. The Viper was resurrected in 2012, making the fifth and final generation of the iconic car. Despite limited resources, the genius engineers of Team Viper were determined to make this version the most powerful yet. With no budget for a complete overhaul, the team had to think outside the box to make it happen. 
They found every possible way to squeeze out more power, from a revised camshaft to stiffer pushrods and ultra-high flow catalytic converters. And with each tweak, they unlocked even more horses under the hood. Finally, the engine tuning dialed into perfection. The Viper roared to life with an astonishing 645 horsepower and a staggering 600 foot-pounds of torque. It was a beast unlike any other. The most powerful, naturally aspirated engine ever fitted to the production car. As the Viper took to the track, it quickly became the force to be reckoned with, racking up win after win in the American Le Mans series. And to take things even further, the team developed the Viper GT3 car race car, a machine built for domination on the track. But as the Viper continued to conquer the racing world, its time was running out. As the final years of the Viper approached, a sense of unease swept across the automotive world. The once mighty icon of American muscle was now struggling to keep up with the times. Lee Iacocca, the man who championed the Viper from the very beginning, had retired and left Chrysler in the hands of others. The mastermind behind the Viper's creation, Bob Lutz, had already departed the company unable to bear witness to the inevitable demise of his beloved masterpiece. With the passing of time, the Viper continued to evolve, but its soul had been lost. The engineers who had poured their hearts and souls into the earlier generations were gone, leaving behind a shell of what the Viper once was. Winkles, Helbig, and Stolberg, the legendary trio that had transformed a sketch on a napkin into an American legend, were relegated to the back room. The Viper was now just another car, safer, more refined, and more expensive than ever before. And then, one day, it was over. The final nail in the coffin had been driven home, and the Viper was no more. Tears flowed freely as fans and enthusiasts mourned the loss of something that had been so much more than just a car. The Viper had been a symbol of American pride, raw power, and the American dream. Its loss was a gut-wrenching blow to all who had loved it. But even in death, the Viper lives on. It exists in our hearts and minds as a symbol of what can be achieved when we put our minds to something. It is a testament to the power of American ingenuity and a reminder that even when all seems lost, there is still hope. The Viper may be gone, but its legacy lives on, forever etched into the annals of automotive history as a shining example of what it means to be American.